Colonel, first of all, thanks for spending a little bit of time with those of us at Aero TV. When I saw this from across the hall, there's just no way you can look at you know, something like this from head on and not get the sweaties. There's just nothing but total animus to an aircraft like this. Tell us what your experience is right now flying this absolute and utter beast. Well, it certainly is a great aircraft and it definitely turns a lot of heads no matter where we go. And Flying this is a whole lot of fun and we first got it from Bulgaria in 2005. It did take a lot of work putting back together, probably five years worth for this one. And now it's uh, got its airworthiness certificate and we fly it almost every week. Now, as I understand, you were a Marine Corps Cobra pilot. How do you train yourself to transition to an MI-24? I was a Cobra pilot, and that did serve me very well for a background. The difference between the two is obviously the Russian aircraft, the rotors turn clockwise, and Americans turn counterclockwise. So that took a little getting used to, but I started training on the MI-2 before I flew the MI-24, and that helped out quite a bit. So I thought the MI-2 was a little more squirrely than the MI-24, obviously. This thing, 26,000 pounds, you don't move that around the wind too much. Uh, it's pretty solid and stable, so very good hovering machine. Tell us the truth. What's this thing fly like? Very smooth, five blades, very fast. The wings provide up to 25% lift at high speed, so they're very functional. Flying along, if you know, you're not cruising, you want to go fast. On a cold day, we've had it you know, above 180 knots, so very quick over 200 miles an hour. You know, the reputation of it was a hell of a predator in its time. It certainly piled up a phenomenal record. When you get a hold of something like this, how do you rebuild it? How do you maintain it? The parts, once again, can't be found at the corner store. No, they're certainly not. And we were very fortunate. After a couple of years of trying to do things through the museum itself, we were able to get some contractors out of Bulgaria, and they were able to help us put everything back together correctly. and do all the testing and evaluation prior to flying and so far everything is functioning extremely well and on this particular aircraft it's one of the tightest aircraft I've ever flown. This aircraft does not have one leak in any of the systems whether it be engine oil, gearbox oil, hydraulics, fuel, it's completely solid all the way through. What did it take to get the FAA to sign off on an MI-24? <laughs> Well, the FAA was very helpful with us and they've always been helpful and we've had a lot of dealings with them because we do a lot of this for our MI2s, for several MI24s and for MiG-21, the MiG-23, L-29, L-39, so everything has worked out quite well and quite smoothly. We've gotten it down. Tell me about the museum, the kind of aircraft that you're collecting, and the fact that uh, it's a flying museum really catches my interest right off the bat. Yeah, it's a great museum. I just became involved with it a few years ago, actually. It's down in Lancaster, Texas, just south of Dallas, about 30 minutes. We have several things there. We uh, display many different aircraft. We start out on the helicopter side, the MI-2, the MI-24, and a Schweitzer. As far as American varieties. We have a Cobra and a Huey. We're working on trying to get those flying and those are actually the toughest to get flying of all of our gear right now. Mm -hmm. On the fixed wing side we have a CJ-6, a Fuga Jet. We display a MiG-21, a MiG-23 and we'll be flying the uh, MiG-23 very soon and I've already done some ground runs on the engine and everything's pretty solid on that. We like to fly our gear and it's the thing that really kind of sets us apart from most other aviation museums because we actually fly them. So what's, what's the future to operating aircraft like this and more important to the museum? What do you hope to do? What is your mission? Well, in the museum, uh, we love to educate and show people the past history, especially of aviation, and the strength of aviation, especially in this area of the country, is immense and this is one of those things that we don't want to let die and hope that we can imbue the next generation with a real fondness for flight. That's one of our major missions and teaching is a good thing. For those of our viewership who are out there in the real world, how can they find out more about the museum and more important, where can they see this fly? We put on our blog on our website, it's uh, cwam.org. You can go there and cruise the site we have several historical blogs you can go check out, cwam.org.
Colonel, thank you for your time. And I got to tell you, there's very few jobs out there I'm jealous of. I'm jealous of this one. Well, it's it's a great job, and I certainly appreciate the fact that I'm doing it. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you, sir, and thank you for your service. Aero TV is brought to you by... The DFC-90 all-digital attitude-based autopilot delivers significant performance and safety improvements over previous generation systems. Its innovative flight envelope protection guards against autopilot-induced stalls, and the straight and level mode provides one-button recovery from unusual attitudes for an added measure of safety. Immensely popular within the Cirrus community, the DFC-90 is now being made available for a growing list of aircraft including Piper Matrix and Mirage, Cessna 182s, and Beach Bonanzas and Barons. Fly with confidence. Fly with DFC-90.